when we when we last talked, uh, we we talked about the Manchurian crisis, right? Yeah. And the the beginning of Japanese aggression in Asia. We had talked about how the military went off on their own and, and took this action without the sanction from the emperor or the prime minister. And how by this point, the prime minister's office and the emperor really couldn't control the actions of the military. But I want you guys to understand that even though we now are seeing a Japan where the militarist, nationalist military has kind of won the day, they're, they're in charge in Japan, that doesn't mean even now all of the military in Japan is seeing eye to eye. And I want you guys to recognize that, like, in our modern day, you know, we have an election back in 2016, and there were some people that supported Donald Trump, and then there were some people that supported Hillary Clinton, and then there were some Bernie bros and some that voted for the Green Party with Jill Stein. Jill Stein. Um, so, so everybody had their own opinion on that election, but, of course, Donald Trump won the presidency. But even after Donald Trump became president in January... And he's a leader of the Republican Party, and the Republican Party controls both houses of Congress. The Republicans now don't all see eye to eye. There's a lot of different opinions and factions within the Republican Party. So the, the United States that we live in today, and you guys certainly recognize today, is really not that different from any big organization where there's going to be a variety of opinions. So even though the militarist, nationalist, imperialist Japanese military has now like won the day in Japan, it doesn't mean that everybody within that organization sees eye to eye with, with each other on what the next step should be. So the militarists have won in Japan. The internationalists are out. But now within the militarist group, within the, the Japanese military, we've got two factions that are going to grow. And so I want you to be familiar with these factions. It's not really... Uh, essential to our story in the long run, but it will help us trace how Japan gets to the point where they're, for example, launching an attack against China in 1937 against us in 1941. So these two factions, the Kodaha and the Toseha. The Kodaha and the Toseha. <coughs> these are each factions within the Japanese military. They have some similarities. They are each imperialist. And what do I mean when I say imperialist? They want to take other countries. Very good. They want to expand Japanese borders. They want to expand. So they're each imperialist. They are each fiercely nationalist. They are each militarist, obviously. They're, they're made up of military. But then there's some differences between them. The Kodaha branch tends to be more radical, tends to be more extreme, willing to use political violence to meet their goals. And their goals are controlling the Japanese government. The Toseha wants to achieve the control of the government through more legal means, by getting members of their, their military into government positions. And then when we go to the Kodaha, they see as Japan's primary threat and maybe the next target for the Japanese, they see the Soviet Union. They're fiercely anti-communist, and they think the Soviet Union should be the next step for Japanese imperialism. That's the Kodaha. Whereas the Toseha see China as the next step. They're already in Manchuria. So the question is, does, China, does Japan go to the north? and start chipping away territory from the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union's east? Or do they head to the south and move against China? This rivalry between these two factions will become violent in the mid-1930s. There will be assassinations of prime ministers in Japan in 1932, for example. A Japanese prime minister named Inukai you don't need to really know his name, but you can just hear it. I-N-U-K-A-I, that is him. Prime Minister Inukai will be assassinated by members of this Kodaha faction. Later in 1936, the Kodaha, many officers from the Kodaha, will lead a march to Tokyo where there is an attempt to launch a coup d'etat, an overthrowing of the Japanese government. Quick time out. Coup d'etat is one of many, come on, 
Not really as quick as I wanted it to be. Oh, come on. There we go. All right, relax. Relax, kids. No dabbing. This is going to live on YouTube for years to come, and that will be so out of style, it will date us, right? All right. The phrase, uh, coup d'etat, is a French phrase. Many of the words that we're going to come across this year in studying all this foreign policy, international relations, they come from the French. Because French used to be the language of international relations. When countries got together for diplomacy, they would often find a common language in French. In fact, the, the, word, the phrase we use today in the English language for the common language to do business in is known as the lingua franca, which is the language of the French. So even though today the lingua franca of the world is English, the language of the French is now English, French is still an important language and we've adopted a lot of these terms for international relations and foreign policy. Coup d'etat is one you're going to see a lot this year. Coup d'etat comes from the French meaning a shaking of the state. And we use that for typically when, uh, when maybe the military has turned on the government in a particular country. And the military with its soldiers and its weapons moves to topple the, uh, the government in power. There we go. There we go. Well, what's so funny? My camera's a little slow. They're acting like idiots. So, in February of 1936... About 1,500 officers from the Kodaha faction march, uh, 1936, march into Tokyo in an attempt to topple the Japanese government. It fails. Fails because there's still opposition in the military, in the Toseha. So this is not a united military at this point. And after this uh, coup d'etat fails, the Kodaha will be discredited in Japan leading to a rise in prominence of this Toseha group. The less radical, wanting to achieve power through more legal means, and wanting to focus on Japan, or pardon me, focus on China as a primary target. Yes? Does this have a name, like, you know, how in Germany the overthrowing has a push? Yeah, um, no, I don't, I mean, it probably does have a name, but uh, that name I do not know. So, I got nothing for you. All, all we need to get out of here is there are factions still within the Japanese military, and ultimately out of those factions, the Toseha wins the day. And now for, for our story about Japanese aggression, this man, Hideki Tojo, Hideki Tojo, is a Toseha general who in 1937 will be made the chief of staff of the Kwangtung Army. Do you recall what the Kwangtung Army is? Yeah, they're the ones that, um, started the fight. They, they started the fight in Manchuria. The Kwangtung Army is the Japanese army in Manchuria. And now Japan controls Manchuria, so there's even more of them. He's made the chief of staff of the Kwangtung Army. Now, if we want to go back to our map, we will notice that Manchuria is just to the north of China, of course. So now that Hideki Tojo has made the chief of staff of this Kwangtung Army, and he's a member of the Toseha, and he, why, and the Toseha now is in control of the military in Japan, what is going to be their next step? China. It's going to be China. So on July 7th, 1937, on July 7th, 1937, and guys, for IB history, these dates are important, and I'm going to repeat them a lot so we can hopefully bury them deep into our minds for, for the May, exams in May. 1931 is, September 1931 is the launching of the Manchurian crisis, the Manchurian invasion. July of 1937, the launching of the invasion of mainland China, or what can be known as the Second Sino-Japanese War. First Sino-Japanese War, 1894. Second Sino-Japanese War, 1937. Many consider this 1937 invasion of China to be the official beginning of a Second World War in, in Asia. Yes? After the First Sino-Japanese War in 1894, 1894 95. Oh, so did they cede Manchuria as a territory? Nope. No, 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 no. They just, um, they ceded some, like, trading concessions and the right for Japan to build railroads in Manchuria. So basically, Japan got 
got rights to do business in Manchuria, they were allowed, and, and after the Russo-Japanese War, they were allowed to put even more in the Manchuria, but they didn't control or own Manchuria at the time. So this was just more like open-door policy. In 1931, did they annex? In 1931, they invade Manchuria, they conquer Manchuria, and they, they don't necessarily annex it okay. like they did to, uh, to Korea, but they create a puppet state out of Manchuria that we call Manchu Kuo. They put Puyi in charge of that. So 1937, this is the invasion of mainland China. This is war now between the Japanese and the Chinese. The Japanese are, are modern in their military. They have a modern air force. The Chinese really don't. In fact, a lot of the, the air force that the Chinese have in this fight are volunteers from Western powers like the United States and Britain that go to China to fight. This war is horribly brutal for the, the Chinese. The Japanese uh, do not follow any conventions of war that existed at the time and certainly none that will exist after World War II. They're horribly brutal to the people in, in China. Uh, you might be familiar with a, a story known as the Rape of Nanking. Uh, Nanking, or as today it's called Nanjing, uh, was the capital of the nationalist government in China. The government would flee. Zheng Jishi would flee Nanjing, leaving the city on its own. When the, Chi when the Japanese came in, they would brutalize the population in, in um, Nanking. So hundreds of thousands murdered, women raped and abused, um, no prisoners being taken, just, just horrible conditions for the, uh, the Japanese. The Japanese, for the Chinese, thank you. The Chinese, uh, the Japanese had hoped the Chinese would quickly surrender. By bringing this brutal war to them, they hoped the Chinese would quickly surrender. The Chinese do not. There is outrage in China. There is outrage in China over the atrocities of the war. Couldn't possibly surrender after the Japanese had done to the Chinese what the, the Japanese had done. Also, as the war pushed deeper into China, as the war pushed deeper into China, Japan gets further and further from their lines of supply, making it harder to maintain their armies fighting in China. The Chinese will begin to employ effective guerrilla tactics. That is a great ape found in the zoo. <laughs> this is a Spanish word for little war. Uh, you don't have to write this, just listen for a second. In the early 1800s, Napoleon Bonaparte had this plan to conquer all of Europe, right? And he was expanding his, his empire uh, beyond the borders of France, conquering nation after nation uh, in the early 1800s. He wanted to bring into his control the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. Now, the king of Spain, he was already in cahoots, so he was okay. But, but Napoleon had to get over to Portugal. So the Spanish king lets Napoleon's army march right in to Spain. This is what's known as Napoleon's Peninsular Campaign because he's going into the Iberian Peninsula. So the French army start marching their way towards Portugal. But many Spaniards say, what the heck? What's all these French guys walking through our, our, our countryside? And the Spaniards began to target the French army. They wouldn't confront them directly but they would do these little attacks and sabotage and booby traps and messing with supply lines of the French army. And these became known as guerrilla fighters, guerrilla warriors. All right, they're, they're bringing little war to the, the French. All right? it, this has always existed for, the, for the, as long as mankind has fought. There have been armies that have been outgunned or outmanned that have resorted to, to, to I know... It, it's hard to get through a day without bringing up something that makes me think of Hamilton lyrics. Um, so the, um, it's happened for as long as mankind has, has fought wars. If you were under, undergunned or out, outmanned by your enemy, you might resort to guerrilla tactics to try to make the fight so difficult, in fact that is the song, that they couldn't stand the cost of the fight and they would just go home, right? That was the goal. Eventually... It helps, it works for the Spanish. Eventually, 
The Vietnamese do it to the French. Eventually, the Vietnamese do it to the Americans. In World War II, the Poles do it to the Russians and the Germans. The French do it to the Germans. Uh, in this fight, the Chinese will use guerrilla tactics against the Japanese that prove to frustrate the Japanese army in China. And then that civil war that the Chinese had been fighting, Zheng Jishi and his Guomindang nationalists, and Mao Zedong and the Communist Party, who had been fighting a civil war for much of the last decade, they will now turn their guns against the Japanese. They will focus their fight against the Japanese. Remember Zheng Jishi back in 1931 let Manchuria go to the Japanese. He said the Japanese are a cancer of the, or a disease of the skin while communism is a disease of the heart. Now that Japan had invaded mainland China, Japanese need to be dealt with. And so Zheng Jishi and Mao Zedong start fighting the Japanese. So Japan will never surrender. China. Oh, goodness gracious, Dobie. China will never surrender. In hopes of convincing the Chinese to surrender, the Japanese create this idea which is called by the Japanese, and I, I wish they had a better ad man, the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Ugh. Yeah, but you need to know it. The Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And here we can see a little Japanese kid, and a little Chinese kid, and a little Manchurian kid, all standing next to each other, happy arm in arm. And the propaganda that the Japanese are trying to sell here is that these countries, that Japan isn't trying to conquer you all. Psh, we're trying to help us. We're going to drive out the Europeans, drive out the Americans, and we will all stand together working for the prosperity of all of us. The Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. So the goal is to convince the Chinese to just go with what's happening. We're trying to help you. But what have the Japanese been doing to the Chinese since the invasion began? Raping and murdering and horrid violence. The Chinese, of course, don't buy into this. But the Japanese will continue to sell this idea to all of East Asia. That they're not trying to conquer you, they're trying to liberate you from Western imperialists. All right? The reality is everybody's too smart for that because they know the Japanese are just imperialists as well. The military, with this invasion, is now effectively controlling the Japanese government. In fact, by 1941, let's go back to him. Pictures are all out of order here. By 1941, this man, Hideki Tojo, will become the prime minister of Japan. So a Japanese general will become the prime minister of the nation of Japan. Good? 1941. 1941. So let's backtrack a little bit. Let's backtrack a little bit. Now there is war in Asia, right? Now there is official war in Asia. There's also, starting in 1939, war in Europe. We'll talk much more about it, but in September of 1939, the Second World War begins in Europe. Germany invades Poland. Yes. Prior to that invasion of Poland, there will be a meeting uh, between the nations of Germany and Italy and, and uh, Japan. And they will get together. Actually, I, I'm off on that, pardon me. After the invasion, in 1940, in September of 1940, Germany and Italy and Japan will get together and sign what is called the Tripartite Pact, the Three-Party Pact. So this is after World War II, it started in Europe. After World War II, it started in Asia. In September of 1940, Germany and Italy and Japan sign what's called the Tripartite Pact. Tri, three. The Tripartite. Three-party or Tripartite Pact. Nice job. It is a military alliance between Germany, Italy, and Japan. If any one of those countries gets, uh, gets attacked or, or has war declared on them by another, they will all stand together. 
This creates a, a symbiotic relationship between Germany and Italy in Europe and Japan in Asia. Because the hope is, that by 1940, the United States is not in a war. But, by 1940, Germany is pretty sure that the United States will be getting into this war. And we'll talk more about that at a later date. So if the United States does jump into the war, if they'd have to fight both Germany in Europe and Japan in Asia, what would the United States be left to do? They'd be fighting, just across a global scale, a two-front war. Or if the Japanese were going to expand their, their, their holdings in Asia and maybe try to take some British holdings in Asia, like Hong Kong, for example, then the British would be left fighting the Nazis in Europe and the Japanese in Asia. Again, a two-front war. Or, if Germany, and Hitler knows what he's going to do in the long run, if Germany ever launches a fight against the Soviet Union, maybe that would embolden the Japanese to try to gain some holdings in the Soviet Union, leaving the Soviets to a two-front war. So, the tripartite pact, this agreement between Nazi Germany, Italy, and Japan. Italy and Germany can take Europe. Japan can take Asia. And they will each help each other out if war is declared by other parties against them. This gives Japan the encouragement to push further. To try to create more of what it's calling the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, but really to just conquer more land for the Japanese Empire. In the spring of 1940, in the spring of 1940, Nazi Germany defeats France. Nazi Germany will overrun France. That is important for our story in Asia because France has an empire in Southeast Asia. It's called French Indochina. We will talk more about this at a later date, but when Nazi Germany defeats France, France is essentially divided into two. The northern part of France, where Paris is, is taken over by the Nazis. The southern part of France, around the city of Vichy in France, becomes a puppet government of the Nazis. Still a French government, ruled by a French leader. A guy named Marshal Patin. He was a, a French war hero from World War I. But it's a puppet government of the Nazis. Just like Pu Yi is ruling a puppet government in Manchu Kuo, a puppet government of the Japanese, the Nazis are essentially controlling the Vichy France regime. regime. They're the ones. Vichy France still controls the French Empire. So with Vichy France in control of Indochina... Japan will be allowed to station troops in French Indochina. All right? When Japan begins to move troops into French Indochina, the British take note. The Americans in the Philippines take note. The Dutch in, in Indonesia take note. This becomes a threat to all of them. In reaction to the, the Japanese moving into Indochina, the Americans, the Americans will begin to try to exert economic pressure on the Japanese. We do this today, guys. Uh, North Korea steps out of line. Economic sanctions. Iran, we think, steps out of line. Economic sanctions. We're going to put punishments on your economy. We won't trade with you. We won't sell to you. We will freeze your assets to try to convince you to change your ways. Yes, ma'am? Sorry, did you say move troops there? The Japanese will move armies into French Indochina, which could be a springboard, one, for the Japanese to ultimately take this over. And anyone want to take a guess at what natural resource in French Indochina would be especially important? Rubber. Some rice, but rubber more than anything else. Yeah, the rubber resources. Uh, this now wakes up the Americans. And so the United States will begin to put economic sanctions on Japan. We'll talk more about this again in a couple days. But by, the, by 1941, we have frozen all trade with Japan. And there are some natural resources that Japan needs more than anything else that we supply them. Coal and iron and oil and steel. Not really a natural resource, but we produce it. 
the steel we trade with Japan. Japan needs this stuff. We cut them off. Now the clock starts ticking for Japan. Tick, 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 tick. They can't fight a war without American trade. They can't win a war without American trade. All right? But yes, they are expanding, but it takes time to start drilling for oil. It takes time to start mining the resources of Manchuria and China. And they're fighting a war while all this is going on. They need this American trade. So Japan will plan an attack on the United States. Should negotiations with the Americans fail, and they will fail, Japan is going to plan an attack on the United States. That attack will be planned for a naval base at Pearl Harbor. This is in Hawaii, smack dab in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This is the island of Oahu. You've heard of the city of Honolulu? It's right here, maybe Waikiki Beach, right down here. Pearl Harbor is a home to uh, an American naval base in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It is of vital importance to the United States. How do all of our ships get around uh, on the open seas in the 1940s? Oil. Diesel fuel, typically, and coal. coal. All right? And so they need refueling stations, and, and Pearl Harbor provides that for them. All right? The Japanese goal is to attack us at Pearl Harbor and deal such a devastating blow to the American Navy that we can't fight the Japanese. The Japanese never intend to invade the United States. That's not in the cards. They can't do that. We're too far away. It would extend them too much. They can't fight us in North America. But they want to destroy this naval base and our ships at Pearl Harbor. They want to destroy ships in the mouth of the harbor that would prevent any new ships from getting in or ships that survived the attack from getting out. They want to destroy aircraft carriers. And if they can so cripple our Navy at Pearl Harbor, they want to force the United States into a negotiation. Force us to do what's called sue for peace. To sue for peace means you kind of hurt us so badly, we can't fight you anymore, so we will negotiate on your terms. And what would the terms be? Sell, sell, sell us oil again. Open up trade of, uh, of steel. Get us iron. Get us, get us coal. All these resources that we need. That's what they want to force the Americans to do. The attack comes on December 7th, 1941. That is absolutely a date you should know. So now we have three years. 1931, invasion of Manchuria. 1937, invasion of China. 1941, attack at Pearl Harbor. What is the, what is the date? December 7th, 1941. The Japanese... With, with fighter bombers coming from Japanese aircraft carriers in the Pacific, will bomb our naval base at Pearl Harbor and air base, an air base nearby um, in, in Oahu. And it will be devastating to the American Navy, but not as successful as the Japanese had hoped. They missed the two aircraft carriers. They, they never close off the, the harbor, and American aircraft carriers are out to sea. So our aircraft carriers survive, and the harbor is never truly closed. But 90% of the ships that were at the harbor, like this one right here, you guys can see, this is uh, the United States, the USS Arizona, it's a battleship, will be sunk. 90% of the ships that were at Pearl Harbor at the time were completely destroyed or severely damaged. But the harbor is never closed down. Wait, what was the other factor? What was the other reason why they failed? They don't close off the harbor. They were hoping to sink ships within the harbor, within the mouth of the harbor, so nothing could get in or out until those ships were removed. The Japanese didn't just attack Hawaii. They also attacked American forces in the Philippines and Guam. They attacked Singapore. Uh, they, they are expanding their attacks to all colonial holdings in Asia. On the next day, on the 8th of December, the United States will declare war on Japan. The United States will declare war on Japan. And so for us, this is our entry into the Second World War. This is December 8th, day after. December 8th, 1941. When we come back in a couple days, we are going to touch on uh, 
the reactions to, from the international community and the United States uh, to Japanese attacks on Manchuria and then China and, of course, Pearl Harbor, all right, where we'll really rehash a lot of these things, uh, but also get in another important topic and how the international community reacts. Questions?